Welcome to the Page One Podcast, a twice-weekly podcast featuring a variety of guests and thought leaders on topics ranging from channel strategies to tariffs, influencer marketing, best-in-class product launches, and all the details about how to accelerate your e-commerce sales with the big box retailers, or what we call R-Commerce. Now, here's your host, Luke Peters. Thanks for joining us on the Page One Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Peters. This is the podcast where I bring you the best and brightest leaders to share consumer product sales and marketing strategies that will help you grow your business. I'm the CEO and founder of Newer Appliances, where I cut my teeth selling products online and now have started Retail Band, where I hope to help other brands succeed in product launches, influencer marketing, and B2B online sales strategy. And right now I'm offering a free evaluation of your online sales strategy. Um, we can go over things like influencer marketing opportunities, look at your Home Depot or Wayfair online sales and see if those can be optimized. And if you're interested, find me on LinkedIn or email me at luke at retailband.com. So in this episode, you're going to learn from Jim Estill, CEO of Danby Appliances and Shipper Beat. Learn how Jim has developed uh, a new product called Parcel Guard from the ground up and Danby sells amazing appliances and Shipper B is revamping outdated parcel shipping. Jim's a Canadian technology entrepreneur, philanthropist, and is the EY Entrepreneur of the Year in 2019, Ontario winner. Uh, Jim grew a technology distribution company from zero to 350 million, then sold to Cinex and became CEO of Cinex Canada and grew that from 800 million to 2 billion in sales. His big focus is on philanthropy and literally is the reason why he works. At least I took that from uh, your LinkedIn, Jim. And uh, listen, thanks for joining us. Uh, Really happy to have you on the show, Jim. Thanks. Well, thanks for having me. Look forward to it. Cool. And, um, and, and I, and I do want to say like, I really look up to what you guys have done at Danby and um, we talk about you over here at newer all the time, Jim. And so it really is an honor to have you and uh, completely looking forward to this interview. Can you start by um, telling us, just tell, let the audience know what does Danby and Shipper do Shipper B do. So uh, Danby is an appliance manufacturer of uh, refrigerators, uh, freezers, wine coolers, um, and we do microwaves. We don't make them; we just put our name on them. Um, so we're basically a appliance manufacturer. We also do air conditioners because they have compressors in them. That's what we do. And Shipper B is a, a courier. It's a basically a parcel delivery company that reduces the greenhouse gas per parcel ship by 73.1%. Awesome. And um, and how do you do that with, with Shipper B? A little more background would be great. Okay. So currently, uh, traditional couriers all go hub and spoke. So to ship from New York to New Jersey goes New York to Memphis to New Jersey. So we break the hub and spoke and go basically um, point to point. But that, you're going to say, well, how do you do that? So you replace the big hubs with micro hubs because the name of the company is Shipper B, we call those hives. So you would have a driver pick up five parcels from the business and drop them at the hive, which would be conveniently located at the interstate and the entrance um, the, at the gas station. And then um, someone would be going down 10 exits. They would just go onto their app and say, I'm going, uh, you know, going to the office or I'm going to visit my sister. And it would say, great, pick up 12 parcels from the hive as you're entering the uh, interstate and drop off uh, 12 as you're exiting the interstate. So that leg of the journey is done using what I call the power of while. What can you do while you're doing something anyways? And then an endpoint driver would pick up the parcels at the other end and deliver them to the consumer. So it is end-to-end, on-your-doorstep delivery. But part of the journey is traveling in a car that was going to be going there anyways. And we don't do hub and spoke. So you end up with actually a faster delivery often as well. So we can do even guaranteed four-hour delivery, which is very difficult to do, or actually it's impossible to do in an old-fashioned hub and spoke. Awesome. Yep. And I, and I looked it up, so I, but, but thanks for explaining that to the audience. So I think it's a great concept, and, and it'll be f- fun to watch and see where that goes. And um, talking about Danby, um, can you fill me in? Tell me how you uh, started at Danby. I believe you invested or, or even purchased a company. I did. So um, I had built my business to a couple billion in sales. I retired and I I moved to New York for uh, five years. My dad got sick, so I moved back to, this is Guelph, Ontario, just outside of Toronto. And I sat on the board of Danby Appliances. The CEO resigned. And so I said, oh, I can go in and run it. And I realized I liked operating a business. And uh, um, then the, the family that owned the Danby said they wanted me to sell it. And I asked how much they wanted me to sell it for. And they told me, I said, okay, fine, I'll take it. 
so I bought the business um, about four years after running it for about a year. So that's how I ended up with Danby. And how long ago did you buy the business? I bought the business about four years ago, and I ran it for a year before that. So I've been in it for about five years. Right. And so yeah, I was going to ask you, why did you get into the crazy, this crazy appliance business, especially now with the tariffs? Um, but uh, great. Okay, so we'll get into that. I mean, that's um, good background to get us started and, and the audience to understand more about Danby. And then talking about Danby, and, and feel free to also fill in for Shipper B if you want to on some of these questions, but can you just give us a little bit more on the scale of the company? So total employees, warehouse size, or where your HQ is, and maybe how your distribution is um, set up, and then um, a breakdown on any unique departments you might have at the company? Sure. So uh, head office for the company is in Guelph, Ontario, which is near Toronto. Um, we have a factory in Coburg, Ontario, factory in Guelph, Ontario, uh, factories in uh, um, uh, Foxborough, Massachusetts, um, Tolleson, which is just outside Phoenix, Arizona, Sarah Land, which is uh, um, near Mobile, Alabama, and Finley, Ohio in the States. Um, we uh, sell about 2 million appliances a year. We've got uh, over a million square feet. And... Uh, so uh, that's the company. We're a sort of a medium-sized appliance uh, company. Half, more than half our sales are in the States. Half our sales are in Canada, roughly. We do business in Mexico. We've got an office in the UK as well. Wow. So you do a big proportion in Canada. I know you guys are, um, the origins are from Canada. And the company, I believe, is about 65 years old, right? Somewhere in that neighborhood. That's right. Yeah, we started in 1947. Great. And then... Um, as far as retailers, I mean, you guys are in a lot of the major mass retailers, and I think you, you do some direct-to-consumer. Um, what is maybe a surprising vertical or category? Is there anything stand out that's different now the last year or two that has uh, surprised you on the growth side? We're kind of weird for an appliance manufacturer. We're leaders in small, large appliances. What do I mean by that? Small white goods. We're very big in bar fridges, half-size uh, fridges, um, and not as big in full-size fridges. So I'm not talking about uh, tabletop appliances. When people when you say you know small appliances, that's not what I mean. I mean refrigerators and freezers. And as far as trends go, um, everything's going towards Energy Star and higher uh, you know better energy. And uh, I'd also say that uh, um, wine coolers are on trend these days. It's an underpenetrated, growing market. And then, I mean, there's been a lot of innovation. I know you you guys have launched the Parcel Guard, which is kind of a big step. I mean, it seems like a, a step away or a, a, a new launch into a different category. And we can talk about that. But um, let, let's first talk about innovation. I mean, you guys have done, you're doing a lot now, Danby, but in your career, you've done a lot in innovation going back many years and in, in, into many different businesses. And you've sat on the board of a lot of companies. And um, how do you think about innovation and where does innovation come from with your companies? So uh, I always look at what are the strengths of uh, the various CEOs and you can be a sales CEO and be good. You can be an accounting CEO and be good. I'm probably an innovation CEO. So I tend to have more ideas um, than we can actually execute on. So uh, if you look at uh, some innovations since I arrived, um, I went out and saw what we were sending off to be recycled and there were some wine coolers that uh, the compressors were gone on. So I said, why don't we take the uh, compressor off of those and put grow lights in that. So we came up with a product called Danby Fresh, which allows you to grow herbs in your uh, basement or your kitchen. It's like a little indoor greenhouse. Um, I figured that's on trend because everyone's on a health thing and E. coli scares and stuff like that, um, as well as people like Fresh. So that's an innovation. Is that going to change the world? No, it's a small innovation. But success in business is all about small, micro competitive advantages. And that is one competitive advantage. So we started doing Danby Fresh using um, wine coolers that had come back. We told the customers that's what we're doing. And then, of course, we sold too many. We didn't have enough wine coolers coming back. So we uh, actually started producing them as a, a new product. So now many more of the ones we sell are our brand new production. That's an example of an innovation. And Parcel Guard would be a huge innovation. Parcel Guard, I, I, that's changing the way we think of ourselves. I, I'm sitting in the factory thinking, okay, we're an appliance company. What's an appliance that we can sell? Or what can we do to be innovative? And I started to think, no, we're not just an appliance company. We're a company that sells big boxes because appliances are big. 
And what's trends? The trend is everyone's getting everything delivered on Amazon and Wayfair and .com. And parcel theft, unfortunately, is a trend. So how can we stop that? I thought about combining my tech background with making big boxes. So we came up with a, a parcel delivery box that when you get an e- get a uh, parcel, it sends you an email to say you have a five-pound parcel arrived at 1046 today. Um, you can look on the IP camera, see who delivered it. If it's too big to go in the top, then you can give someone a one-time use code to put it in the bottom. You can two-way voice. You can talk to the person on your front porch. And uh, so that's uh, how that innovation happens. And, and talking about trend, do you have a tool? I mean, where, where are you getting your trend ideas? Is it just, you know, reading the news and running your business and talking to colleagues? Or is there like a special service report, newspaper or online tool that you put a lot of value in that, you know, kind of provides where trends are going? So I, I'm a information junkie and I just read everything I can, talk to everybody I can and just try to notice what is on trend. So, uh, like we were exhibiting at the CES show and I am sort of trying to pick up what are the trends, right? What's the trends at the CES show? And it's stuff that we're not involved in, but it's good to see that, uh, you know, health trackers are on trend because last year, how many health tracker booths were there? I don't know, maybe three or four or five. Yep. How many are there this year? 50. Um, so I, I do track trends. And I found in business, it's much easier to sell if you're on trend. So with parcel theft, for instance, you know, it's, it's on trend and parcel delivery is growing by 20% per year. It, it, that's a really growth market. I'd love to say that freezer are going to grow by 20% per year, but they're not. What's the trend in freezer? It's like kind of replacement freezer. It's a mm-hmm. white box that freezes stuff. Yeah. Excellent. I mean, that, that, that's great. That's, that's good to hear your philosophy on it. And kind of going back, you know, going back about five years when you started leading Danby and then a, a year after purchased the company, um, looking back, what were the biggest changes that you put into the company? I mean, the reason is it, it would be great to hear just because it's a, uh, you know, a, an older company probably had a lot of processes in place that it was doing for a long time. And then you're coming in with fresh ideas and, and just curious, like how you change things up or what you add and what you removed. Well, I have a tech background, so we do tend to add technology to our product. Um, and although appliances don't seem to be changing much, the standards are changing pretty quickly. And the, the environmental, so one thing that I is one of my personal passions is I believe we have to be good for the environment. So what can we do to be lower power consumption? And we've spent a lot of uh, time and energy around that. And the other thing that people want is styling. That's particularly true when you're talking something like a wine cooler. People want, you don't invite your friends over to show them your fine wine and, and put it in a chintzy little box in the back. You want it to be, uh, to look nice. So styling is uh, another, uh, I believe that's another on trend thing. You don't need styling in a freezer. I mean, a freezer is kind of like a freezer, as I said, but even refrigerators, people like, uh, like sexy styling. Yep. And with that, I know you have some thoughts on competitive advantage. Um, you know, you've grown from zero to 2 billion in sales. I mean, starting out of the trunk of a car. So uh, love to hear if you could talk about what competitive advantage means to you. Um, how do you create it in your companies and maybe a specific example? So um, competitive advantage is just what's something that you can do easier, better, cheaper than someone else? Or is there a way, is there a special relationship that you can sell better than someone or sell at a lower cost than someone else? So I have generally been successful by small competitive advantages. But when I joined the board of BlackBerry, they had a huge competitive advantage. There was no such thing as a smartphone. So their huge competitive advantage was to invent a smartphone and to become the first smartphone company in the market. Um, As far as examples in my business, um, I was, we're not big in tabletop appliances. But uh, I was in the warehouse and I saw at the top of containers on product coming in that there was a one and a half foot gap or one foot gap. I said, wait a minute, we just paid to ship that product in. Um, what can we put in that space? So we went out to a um, company that makes electric kettles and said, can you put Danby on one of your electric kettles? And then we can fill that space with electric kettles. And then at the same time, um, I know everything's being bought online. And when you buy a normal electric kettle online, it comes in a color box. They have to put in a brown box so that the box doesn't get 
racked. And we said, no, let's put it in a brown box. So we save a dollar on the, on the cardboard box. You save a dollar fifty on the shipping. You save 50 cents on the overbox. So at the end of the day, you've got a $3 cost advantage on an item that's only worth $30. Um, so that's an example of a competitive advantage. It's a good example. And, and I read, uh, I think I might've read this on, uh, or maybe it was on the, on the form that you had sent over a pre-interview, but I thought it was really interesting where you, you had fail fast, fail off and fail cheap. And I, I kind of wrote jokingly that I like the fail cheap part because it's not, it's not always easy to fail cheap. The problem is sometimes these, you know, as an entrepreneur failures can be expensive, but um, would love to hear you elaborate on this. And, and, and even, you know, cause it isn't, it, it isn't actually, it's a real question is really how can you try to fail cheap? Because I guess you could maybe limit your investment up front um, or take a lot of uh, chances or opportunities on things. And it sounds like you really are an innovative idea guy. So um, we'd love to hear your feedback on this. Yeah. So it's fail often, fail fast, fail cheap. And another expression that goes along with that is having a failure does not make you a failure. You're a show that people, entrepreneurs listen to and entrepreneurs succeed because they're willing to take a risk and they're willing to have some failures, but you do have to do all three fail often. That means try a lot of things, fail fast, so don't go and you know keep pounding your head against the wall for five years and fail cheap. And so for me, cheap is within the realm of the affordable. So if I can afford to try something and it doesn't work, uh, you know I lose money, I don't enjoy it, but I have to celebrate that I was willing to try it because some of the things that we're willing to try work out. And uh, so it's the fail off and fail fast, fail cheap, and also creating a culture of failure in your company. And that sounds weird, but the reason that's important, uh, and what I mean by that is not zapping people for trying, not zapping people for having a failure. Um, so uh, create the culture of failure and celebrate it and do it and shake it off when you have a yacht failure. Yeah. And I mean, in, in, with tariffs and then, of course, you know, you're probably facing the same thing with all the uh, DOE changes. Um, there's a lot of trial and error that goes into some of these things. So this that phrase couldn't be, you know, the timing couldn't be more perfect than right now because there's just so much fluctuation in the market. Um, but I like that one. That, that That's a good description of that. And Jim, you've led some large companies with a lot of people um, and love to hear, you know, your thoughts on company culture, how you build company culture. I know you've um, won quite a bit of awards for some humanitarian work and all kinds of cool things that you've done in that area, um, incorporating, um, uh, different folks into your company. And if you could elaborate on that, I think the audience would, uh, could learn a lot. Sure. Um, I mean, you win awards. They like to give entrepreneurs awards. They like to give, you know, they like to, to say, Oh, the entrepreneur did it. But as you know, it's not the entrepreneur that does all the work. I don't do any of the work. I just go and accept the awards on behalf of all my people that do, uh, all of the work. So I did a, the big philanthropic project I was known for is I brought in, uh, 500 Syrian refugee families, or not families, 500 Syrian refugees, and resettled them in our community. Um, and one unintended consequence of that was I ended up with galvanizing the company and creating a high spirit, and culturally that galvanized and brought the company together. And what, what I found is the, that young people, particularly 20 somethings, I like to think it's inspirational to make another thousand freezers, but they think it's more inspirational to save the world for some yeah, reason. That's funny. Yep. And how did you bring in the, the 500 refugees? I'd love to hear more in the backstory on that. Oh, so that was done under a Canadian program. Canada has a program where private individuals can pay for uh, people to resettle. So it was, it was done under a private sponsorship um, program. And that was the, that was the one thing I did, which got a lot of press that there's a lot of other things, which, which uh, don't necessarily get press. I believe that using business for good is the way to totally change the world. That's why I'm so excited by Shipper B, because Shipper B can save 73.1% of the greenhouse gas. As we scale Shipper B, just the company being successful means the world successful. And it even provides an income for people on the side. So it, it's, it's just like win, win, win. The, the people make money for driving distances they were already going to drive anyways. and um, we save greenhouse gas. We take trucks off the road. Nothing against trucks on the road. But when parcel uh, is growing by 20% per year, 
even if we were to get 1% of the growth, and I don't think we would even get that, it means that you still need 20% more <laughs> trucks to do the other parcels or 19% more trucks to do the other parcels, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And how is that company doing? What are you able to say about that? I'd love to hear, because I haven't seen as, as much in the press. I know I've, I've seen a lot about the parcel guard and it's just because, you know, I'm, I'm following more on the appliance side of, of the business. Exactly. Um, what can you share more about, you know, the growth of Shipper B? So, I mean, Shipper B is a relatively new company. We've only launched recently. We've only launched in a small geographic area in Canada. We have not yet rolled out to the States. Unlike parcel guard, where we're largely in full production and we're largely available, North America wide and we're shipping product every day. So yes, you have not heard much about Shipper B because we're, um, I'm not going to say we're beta, but we're early stage shipping uh, small quantities of parcels. When you introduce a new product, my experience is you need to have five-star reviews. You need to have all perfect product, or in our case, it's a service. So you have to have five-star reviews. So you, you run the sales a little slower than you could just so that the service experience is perfect for the shipper and perfect for the driver. So the drivers say, wow, this is a great company. And the shippers say, wow, this is a great company. And then they go tell, tell all their friends. Um, I don't want to say that that's not important once you're a, a well-developed company. But, you know, if Danby, if you were to put a one-star review up on one of our products, you know, we've got 862 other reviews that aren't one-star. So you, you don't kill a product but if you bring out a brand new product and get you know one one star review or three one star reviews uh, it, it, you can kill your product before you start and it is a beta product so we do need to test and you know make sure that the routing algorithm works and the app works and um all of that kind of stuff yeah it makes sense and then you know kind of sticking with company culture and talking about your leadership team um we just kind of love to hear your wisdom on how you know, what type of people do you want on your leadership team? Um, how do you choose or interview or what skills, characteristics, or attributes do you look for on your um, key leadership team for either company or both? The most important thing is character. You can't train character. You can train skills. You can't train character. It's very difficult to train basic intelligence. So if you hire bright people who care, then they can execute. Um, that's largely... Uh, what I believe in culture, uh, above our front door is our tagline, which says, do the right thing. And I use that as, uh, how do you figure out how to do your job? How do you treat your customers? Well, you do the right thing. Do you ship a product that's not good? No, you do the right thing. Do you, how do you treat your coworkers? You do the right thing. It's way easier than trying to have an employee manual that has every eventuality and how do you, how do you do things? Um, so that's kind of um, in the culture. I am also what I will call exactly the opposite of a micromanager. I believe as you scale a business, the more employees you have, the more important it is for the leader to coach on culture, but let everyone else make the decisions. Because if I make all the decisions, then we get a funnel point and everyone's waiting for me to decide. And I have to be very careful not to second guess decisions that are made. So if I come in and someone painted lines on the parking lot, and they're yellow, and I would have preferred white. I have to be careful. Do is how important is that battle? Because as soon as I complain or, or say, you know, the the lines are the wrong color, next thing I'm going to be picking the the, the everyone's going to come to me anytime anything gets done. Uh, actually, a better example: you come in the classrooms painted. I don't like the color. They're going to say, okay, so now we have to get Jim to pick all the pink colors and and whatnot. Now, what's cultural? If I come in the classrooms painted, and uh, the bill comes in at ten thousand dollars, and I have to say, whoa, did we get our three quotes on this and did it really need to be painted? Um, because culturally you want a culture of people who care and people who uh, spend our money wisely. Uh, I always tell people to make sure that we add value. Are we adding, is this adding value? Do our customers want this and are they willing to pay for it? So it, it, otherwise we shouldn't be spending the money because why would we spend money on something if the customers aren't willing to, uh, don't think it has any value to them. Wise advice. So do the right thing. I love that quote. And, and then character intelligence. The hard thing is it's hard to interview for character, but I guess that's where re referrals and in knowing people's backgrounds can really help. But um, definitely agree with that. And I think that's um, you, you put those two things together and, and you're going to get solid people. And and uh, and I love your philosophy, you know, the opposite of a micromanager and 
And I know, you know, especially smaller companies like mine and, and other folks listening, it's tough, you know, because there's so many areas we want to help out in, but you gave good examples on why the CEO needs to back off a little bit and, and let the decisions flow from the team. Um, so that, that, was, that was well said. Um, looking at your org chart, you know, again, you came into the company five years ago. Um, I'm sure there might be some changes or I'm guessing, is there like a, any structural changes? I know, I know you talked about technology earlier and, um, you know, I just, I loved it. I always like to know how things are put together and I'm, I'm guessing the audience is curious as well. And, and, and I'm sure that, you know, Danby has a finance and marketing and sales, but I'm just curious if anything structurally was changed or added that might be unique or, or different than, than how it was originally. So I, I didn't make any fundamental uh, changes. And as you say, we've got, you know, sales and marketing and finance and um, logistics and all of that kind of stuff. Um, one of the things that I do push, though, is high collaboration. Because just because someone's a marketing person doesn't mean they don't have a good idea on how we can um, do something in logistics. Or just because you're a logistics person doesn't mean that you can't um, coach the sales reps, you know, if you sell these, then we can get more in a truck. And, uh, and by the way, these are collecting dust, even though the computer report says they're collecting dust. So, um, one of my big things is to collaborate and get every, you can get people to, uh, to collaborate and not point fingers. It's, it's not, if we're not doing something, it's okay. We are not doing something. It's not, you know, operation didn't ship fast enough. It's like, okay, we didn't ship fast enough. How are we going to make it so that we can ship uh, faster and understanding what our impact is on other areas of the company? And you've talked about, Jim, you've talked about some of the different areas that you guys are innovating. And we've talked about strategy and kind of the inner workings of Danby, but kind of on the growth strategy, you know, you guys are, I guess, um, launching, getting into new categories or going deeper or better into your current categories. Is that uh, the growth strategy or are you also, do you have an acquisition plan as well that Danby is running side by side of picking up certain brands or categories that you guys are interested in? Or is there anything you can elaborate on that end? So largely um, we are expanding around what we do. For instance, we opened our UK office. It, it didn't exist five years ago or three years ago. So that is, you know, we're still selling appliances. It's going into an incremental market. And things like the herb grower is that it's a fringe incremental market. So we tend to go into incremental markets. We're not in the market to buy companies, but I'm not opposed to buying um, a company if the right fit were to come along. I do believe that many companies buy companies and it doesn't work out that way. I've been involved in many acquisitions. I've seen from the sidelines um, acquisitions that work and don't. The ones that work tend to be ones that are small enough that the company that's buying them can digest them well and tend to be ones that have high synergies. And so that you can, uh, um, you know, really goose the sales because the, maybe the sales channel is, uh, is the same or reduce the cost because uh, you're using the same trucks to ship product or something like that. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And then another thing I wanted to get into was product launches. Um, I've seen you doing a good job pitching Parcel Guard and at Follow You on LinkedIn, but also you guys have gotten a lot of good press on Parcel Guard as well. And um, obviously, you know, there's got to be some PR and marketing behind that. But interesting to get your take on product launches. They're so important, especially in this category. And like you talked about, you know, having good reviews right at the beginning, but there's a lot more than that. So are you able to, you know, talk about your product launch process and in really, you know, two to three things to you that might stand out that you think you guys are doing a good job, but maybe other businesses aren't or they're missing out on or, or something that um, is innovative that you guys might be doing? Sure. So um, you mentioned that Parcel Guard has had a lot of press. And the interesting thing about that, I think the reason it's had a lot of press is it's truly unique and it's kind of new and it's on trend. That makes it easy. So when we bring out a new bar fridge and tell them, oh, it's a, you know, two cubic foot, it's like, well, that's not very uh, newsworthy. So we've been lucky to be newsworthy by having something that genuinely is new. And many companies that we're competing with in the news and send out their press releases, they're only doing tiny um, increment, increments, if that makes sense. Yep. As far as new product launches, my experience is you need to launch and you need to relaunch, and then you need to relaunch, and then you need to relaunch. You need to kick, 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 because although um, you've seen it, Parcel Guard in the press, 
you need to see it in the press again, and then you need to read it on the social media, and then you need to uh, hear more about it, and then the sales rep needs to show it to you, and then the sales rep needs to call you and tell you about it. It just uh, doesn't happen ever as fast. I guess one other good characteristic of a company is companies that have high sense of urgency win. And so that means by nature, I'm an impatient guy. So nothing ever happens fast enough and you have to kick and then re-kick and then re-kick, especially when you're in a brand new category like a parcel guard. But when you're in an established category like um, microwaves, again, people aren't just going to buy my microwave because I have a microwave. It's kind of like a microwave that heats up food. What's the, uh, why would they buy my microwave versus someone else's? You have to look at your competitive advantage and your story. And there almost always is a story for the company you're selling to. Hey, one thing I picked up on there, Jim, was you're, you're, you mentioned you're an impatient guy. So I'm the same way. So maybe I can learn something from you here. But how do you then work with your leadership team on that? And sometimes, you know, the, the, the other team, maybe like in, in my case, they're more thoughtful, you know, but they may not be as is, is always as quick as I want to be. And, and of course, you know, I'm making a lot of mistakes by being too quick, but, um, you know, on your end, how has that, um, change been at the company where you come in and you want things to happen yesterday, and then you got to convey that or change the culture with your leadership team. So one of my tricks is, um, work on lead measures that creates lag measure. What I mean by that is you may not be able to sell 10,000 units. That's a lag measure, but you can, send a thousand emails, you can make a thousand calls, you can, you can go through activity. So I focus a lot on what are the lead measures that will ultimately re- result in sales and, and praise and celebrate those lead measures, even though you might not yet have the sales that you, uh, you want on that. Um, and the more you can figure out what exactly what your lead measures are, the more success you'll have in the, uh, in the medium term. Another management trick I use is what I call roll up weekly reports. So the salesperson sends a weekly report to the sales manager um, and the sales manager sends a weekly report to the vice president of sales, vice president of sales sends a weekly report to me. So I get all of these weekly reports rolling back in and I ask them to report on specific things. Parcel guard would be a good example. Um, Your weekly report uh, says, you know, my goals this week were this, I accomplished this, my goals next week are this, and here's what I did around parcel guard. Just by knowing every week you have to say, here's what I did around parcel guard means they're going to do something around parcel guard. You want to send in a weekly report and said, well, I didn't tell anybody about it. I didn't do anything about it. So asking people is a polite way of also getting people to uh, focus on it. Everyone knows when I talk to them, I'm going to ask about new products and about specific things. Now, as a company leader where we have to be careful, I can't have 20 important things. So I can't ask about, um, you know, Dan be fresh and parcel guard and the new wine cooler and the, you know, this and that you, you, cause then you become completely defocused, but that's how I keep the sense of urgency and focus on is by asking people to report on uh, our specific goal. Yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, that it's, it, I, and I'm doing something very similar. So I, I like that. And I guess you could even put in your lead measures right into the reporting. So in, in some cases, you totally do. That's perfect. So, so making sure the audience got that. So lead measure measures versus lagging measures. And uh, I'm, I'm on the same page. That's exactly. And I'm always like, like you said, focus on the leading. Like if we have a lot of sales, I mean, those are, those are done, but are we, how are we going to get new sales? Right. Or, or, or did those sales happen just because a company went and bought, you know, a bunch of uh, stock inventory, meaning they haven't sold the product yet. So it doesn't, it means a lot, but not also because they have to sell it. And then you could be dealing with the return if, if there isn't sell through. So I'm definitely appreciate the way you look at it, looking at leading measures. Um, so cool that that's, um, excellent way of pulling things together. And Jim, you've written a couple books. So I, that was cool. I, I was looking into that yesterday and found that out. And, um, specifically I know time management is so important and it looks like you wrote a book on that called, uh, time leadership using the secrets of leadership for time management. Uh, I've read a lot of time management books. Some of them are just, um, are, you know, everybody has a different style. Some of them are a little bit too rigorous. So those didn't work for me. Some of the ones with like just big, you know, compass ideas, like directional ideas worked really good for me. And, um, and I think I've learned a lot over the last couple of years on time management. I'd love to hear what your 
two to three key takeaways are for say that, you know, the brand owners listening to this podcast and, you know, where, you know, company owners might be making mistakes and, um, you know, your thoughts on that. So the reason I called the book time leadership is leadership is about direction where management is about the execution of the speed. So if I want to go from uh, Cleveland to Chicago, the first thing I better do is head the right direction. I don't want to go at a hundred miles an hour. So time management, there's really two dimensions to it. We all have the same amount of time. It's all about priorities. So that's when I'm talking about leadership, knowing what your priorities are. And the second part of it, and I've gained this more insight more as I've gotten older, um, it's about energy. So I find when I'm wasting time, it's usually because I'm low energy. So I spend a lot of time on my health and trying to um, get myself more energy because it's, it's more about energy than it is about time, to tell you the truth. Wow. And how, any tips or suggestions on, uh, on where you found more energy? Uh, well, for me, a lot of it has to do with physical health. So basically, it's exercise and eating, right? That's an obvious one. Another one is uh, focusing on things that inspire me. So when I'm inspired, I, I almost don't need sleep. Where when I am doing things that I'm not necessarily inspired by, I, I do tend to um, lose energy. So knowing more about what I love to do, I can spend more time in that. And knowing stuff that I don't particularly love doing. Interestingly enough, you say, oh, those are bad jobs. No, there's actually a lot of people who work for me who love doing what I would consider to be a pull my hair out job, and I don't particularly enjoy it. Um, simple example, I'm not, I don't particularly love accounting, but if I went out and gave one of my accounting guys, oh, do this very complicated spreadsheet, they're going to think, wow, Jim gave me this awesome project. I just love it. I could spend two hours doing this spreadsheet and uh, where I would have lost all my energy doing that. Yep. And, and, and I like that because it's a different way to look at it, but I completely agree. And especially for entrepreneurs who are just running themselves too hard, you know, we get stuck in those ruts where it, it can actually be unhealthy, you know, and we're not sleeping enough or, um, you know, getting out our head out of the business. But I guess, you know, on also on, on the other end of it, are there any tools or ways that you organize um, your week or your day to stay on point? Oh, sure. I mean, I, I, uh, I actually set my, the alarm on my phone for every meeting, every conference call, and I leave myself enough time. So if I have a meeting at two and I'm not in the location, I'll set it for five to two or 10 to two or whatever I have to do. That's an easy, easy. So as a result, I never have to be late. And if I'm actually meeting with you, you tend to uh, respect my alarm. Yep. So if my alarm goes off, I say, listen, I got to get to my next meeting. That's a simple way to keep on track. Um, the other thing I, I like to do is the night before, I always look at my day the next day to see what do I have on when and, and that kind of gets my mind thinking about it. Um, and one of the to-do list tricks, which was not my, uh, as a, matter of, a lot of my time management book was not my ideas. It was other ideas I gleaned from other places is on my to-do list, you put down the to-do, what you have to do, and the first thing necessary to move you forward on that to-do. Because what I find is when I do that, I often do the first step or even the first two or three steps because I've thought about what do I need to uh, move forward on that next step. Yeah. I mean that, and that's key, especially for younger people. Cause I think what happens is then they can get stuck thinking too much. And then if you just, you know, you keep that pencil moving and like you said, okay, what's the next step? Um, I think it's like magic, just like you said, it can, it can help really help move it forward. In you know, another question I wanted to ask Jim is you've had so many successes and worked with a lot of companies. And as, as we talked about, sat on a bunch of boards, but what has been maybe one big failure, like a, a really tough one, something that you've learned from and that has actually, you know, improved yourself or your business? Well, I mean, I've had a, a number of failures. I will say I'm on my second marriage. I lost my first marriage. That was a big failure. And that's because I did not put on my goal list essentially to stay, stay married. <laughs> yep. So I strongly recommend, um, I, I, I did a, a talk last night to uh, an organization asked me to speak about wealth and entrepreneurship. And one of the slides I said is, love your spouse and treat them well, because otherwise you lose half your wealth. <laughs> That's the way <laughs> the world works. Yep. <laughs> but but the spouses don't fit as easily around the other goals. I can't say, oh, I'm going to uh, tick this box and uh, make another 50 calls and that'll uh, make her happy, but uh, it's just that's an example, and that's a highly personal example. I, I, I even tell people 
ask me a business problem, I'm good at, per, at business problems, personal problems, a little tougher. Yeah. Well, listen, thank, I appreciate the honesty there. Cause that, that's a, I mean, that's a very relevant one though. And, and definitely something that's um, important in, in culture and uh, good advice there. And, you know, kind of along with that, what is something, maybe it's a, a habit, morning habit, a ritual or a practice that you've learned or done that has made you a better person, you know, either at work or home. So, um, Shipper B is based on the power of while. What can you do while you're doing something else? That's in my book on time management. I talk about what are what can you do while you're doing things. So one thing that I do that's very simple, I listen to audiobooks and podcasts when I'm in my car. And everyone thinks, wow, Jim's read every single book. I will tell you that of the ones that I've read, half of them I listen to. And even though I don't have a long commute, I do end up driving places and uh, whatnot. I sometimes listen to them while I exercise as well. So it's using that power of while. And uh, another thing I'm known for is walking meetings. So when I uh, meet with people, we go for a walk. And so I'm getting a little bit of exercise. What can I do while I'm meeting with someone? I get a little bit of exercise. Interestingly enough, it actually makes it more memorable. So I've had a walking meeting with someone and all of a sudden 10 years later, I haven't talked to them and they say, oh, I still remember that meeting. Because if I had a meeting in my boardroom, it's like kind of like every other boring boardroom you ever saw. And it's leveling too. So if I'm meeting with an employee, it's kind of scary to meet across the desk from a, C, a, a mean CEO like me. Yep. It's not when you go for a walk, you're shoulder to shoulder, you know, outside. So I love it. You know what? That's uh, you're actually, I'm actually writing that down because I need to get back into that. And I've done it a little bit. And I heard that Steve Jobs did that a lot. And, you know, he was always running all over the place. And, um, but I love it. I think it's such a, it's, it's great idea and it's, it's fun and you get the two for one and I'm all about the two for one. But like you said, it's, um, can be less intimidating as well. Um, and, and those are usually kind of like, just curious, you walk in or outside around the building or is that through the warehouse or just curious on, on where those walks happen at Danby? Yeah. So I actually have a trail, which I have to get in my car and drive, but it's only two minutes. You drive two or three minutes to the trail and I walk basically through this little woods and down to a river. And uh, I've got a few different walks. So some of them are like one of them is 20 minutes, one of them is 30 minutes. And so it depends on whether I need to talk to you for 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Another thing I like about a walking meeting is it actually does bring a meeting to a close because, you know, we just walk down to the river and back and that was our half hour and we get in the car and come back uh, where if you're in my office or in a boardroom, it's too easy to say, oh, well, we'll just keep on chatting here. Um, and, and you would be surprised at how much you can get done in 20 minutes. Um, I basically don't like one hour meetings. I like 20 minute meetings. Yeah, it, it, I'm with you. We try to schedule, we definitely don't go over an hour. We try to schedule a bunch of half hour, but I, I like that strategy. I'll have to do like, you know, a walk around the building or a, a walk over to, we're, we're kind of near a bunch of restaurants. So it's, it, it does work really good for lunch, but um, I wish we had some trails over here. That, that, that is pretty cool that you have that. And then you talked about listening to books and podcasts. So we'd love to hear your, um, you know, one of your favorite book recommendations for listeners. I mean, an old time classic that I like is 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing. I'm a marketing guy. Another one I like is um, Influence the uh, Psychology of Persuasion is another um, classic for sure. Yep. Um, th- there's so many that I uh, almost can hardly even think of them all, if you know what I mean. Yeah, um, I gotcha. Uh, I, I like Malcolm Gladwell. His, uh, his uh, you know. Fellow, fellow Canadian. Good. Yeah, he's a good writer. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he's super interesting and, and really good um, reader, by the way. So you probably listen to his audio books. Like he's, he's got a great voice and a good style. So he make, he makes the books fun. That's right. Sapiens a pretty good one as well. Okay, good. I haven't, I haven't read that one. I'll, I'll write that down. Um, listen, I really, you know, enjoyed the, the time with you here today on the page one podcast and, and appreciate all your thoughts and wisdom here. How can listeners find you, learn more about you or your companies? Well, the company is Danby Appliances. It's just www.danby.com. I have a blog at www.jimestel.com, although I don't blog very much. And I'm very Googleable. Jim Estel is actually a unique, uh, unique uh, name, so anybody can do that. And Shipper B is just shipperb.com. Yep, and that's Estel with two L's at the end. And 
Just want to thank you for joining me on the page one podcast and the audience as well. And quick reminder that I'm offering a free evaluation of your online sales strategy. Um, we can look into your influencer marketing, Amazon, HD, Wayfair, all the digital sales help you guys from a strategic standpoint, um, help you understand a keyword and search options and advertising options on those um, various channels. And uh, just find me at Luke at retailband.com or on LinkedIn and uh, happy to help you from there. And I want to thank you all again for listening and appreciate everybody who listens, all of your comments, suggestions, and reviews. See you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to the page one podcast with Luke Peters. If you like our show and want to know more, check out our other segments. Also, please help us out by leaving us a rating on iTunes. Want to learn more about our commerce? Check out www.retailband.com to get more great tips and tricks on how to accelerate your e-commerce sales with the big box retailers.